language path and still go ahead and ask. So the Python language is a high-level language. We've talked about high-level languages. What does that mean? It means it supports an English-like text, right? If and while and import and those English-like words. Although, you know, conceivably you could write a high-level language in another language. It's just that traditionally most of them have been written in English because the English and the Americans were the first ones to create programming languages. After that, there have to be some written in foreign languages, right? It'd be interesting to, well, just out of curiosity, let's Google it. Foreign language computer languages. Let's see if there are any. Non-English based programming languages. Arabic. Yeah, I can see the need for that. Algol was published in several different languages. Because, right, you could just take a language and instead of the word, you know, print, you could use, you know, whatever the uh, Russian word is for print and the Russian word is for while and stuff like that. I could see somebody making some kind of translation like that. It, the language would work just as well. So they took this language called Algol and turned it into Russian, German, French, and so on. Oh, here's all these cool things. Yeah, there's a bunch of languages not written in English. So can you imagine the trouble that the poor students who don't know English learn have to do when they, uh, you know, start learning a program? It'd be the same problem I would have if I started trying to program in Kalamat and I didn't know Arabic. Just a historical point. The way of the program. There are plenty of others. There's C++, Java, C Sharp. By the way, if y'all like my teaching style and you feel like taking uh, scripting from me, that's pretty awesome. I teach it in the fall and in the spring. Also, C++ is a great programming language. Um, it's very commonly used in the business because it makes very fast programs. So things like PlayStation games and stuff like that are often written in C++, things that need to run maximally fast. As you might infer from the name high-level language, there are low-level languages known as machine language, but we've talked about enough of that. So when we launch idle, we get the shell or the interpreter different versions of the applications of the IDEs, call it <clears throat> different things, but when we launch idle, dun, 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 dun. this one calls it the shell. Shell, interpreter, same thing. It's just a place where we can enter Python commands. It's not a place where we do our programming, but we can enter Python commands. They're using one called PyScripter in their examples. Feel free to use anything you want to to write your Python program. We don't have PyScripter on our machines, but we do have PyCharm. And I know that there's at least one instructor who uh, teaches using PyCharm. I use idle because it's installed by default. Everything gives you idle every time you install it. I'm not going to use PyCharm, so I wish it wasn't here, Rick. I could accept. Great. Wish I had chosen it. Go away. So what is a program? It's a sequence of instructions directing the computer what to do. Just like if I set up here and I pretended you were a robot and didn't, you know, have a uh, mind of your own, I could tell you, you know, stand up, turn to your left 90 degrees, walk forward, turn to your left again, and you know, you might get out of the, you know, the room if I gave you the instructions like that. Same idea. Broadly speaking, we have input, get data from the keyboard. We have output. Now we've used the word print for our output. We have math. Then there's something called conditional execution, also known as decisions. I believe that our book calls it decision. Conditional execution means that it only happens sometimes. Why would you want something to only happen sometimes? Like accelerate your spaceship while the button is down, right? You're playing a game. Press the button down, the spaceship starts accelerating. So your code would have an if statement. If button is down, add something to the acceleration. And then repetition. Re perform some action repeatedly. It says usually with some variation. Well, okay. Don't know about that. But yeah, report, perform some action repeatedly. Ask the user if they want to repeat the calculation, right? Do you wish to do it again? Or it's just constantly looping, waiting for the program to exit. Right? Like my Pac-Man example. It's going to keep running until, you know, all the Pac-Men are, are dead. 
right? You know, while Pac-Man lives greater than one, keep playing the game. Believe it or not, that's pretty much all there is to it. So what is debugging? Debugging is when you're trying to find the flaws. The use of the term bug to describe small engineering difficulties dates back to at least 1889 when Thomas Edison had a bug stuck inside his phonograph. Okay, that, that goes back even earlier than the 40s in Grace Hopper's bug. Broadly speaking, three kinds of errors. Syntax, we've talked about that a way bunch. Runtime errors, we've talked about that a little. The program reaches a point where it just can't work any further. The disk is full. It can't get to the internet. It divides by zero, right? Just can't run. Now, that's, some books are called on a logic error because you can accommodate for a runtime error using better logic. What do I mean by that? If the disk is full, you could tell the user that and let them pick a new file name or something like that rather than just quit the program, right? But it's a different category. And then a semantic error. Now the book calls this, this textbook calls it a semantic error. Our textbook calls it a logic error. Most people call it a logic error. Same thing. Program just does the wrong thing. It doesn't crash, it just does the wrong thing. You press the accelerate button and instead your spaceship breaks. You're trying to calculate, you know, how many grams to kilograms and it always calculates the, error, uh, the value zero. Something like that. We know what a syntax error is. la di da di da I've talked about runtime errors, but here's a good point. Sometimes they're called exceptions because they indicate that something exceptionally bad has happened. The disk is full, right? The file is corrupted. It's trying to access a device that's no longer plugged in, right? Can't, can't save to the floppy if the floppy's been ejected. How many people have floppies anymore? Runtime errors are the one, okay. Runtime errors are rare in the kind of stuff we're using right now because there's not going to be a runtime error when we're at, well, nah, I'm not going to say that. We're going to have to struggle with runtime errors each and every time. And that's when the user types in something other than a number. We ask them to type in a number, they enter something other than a number, our program's going to crash. We could fix that with good logic, but that's an example of a runtime error. Experimental debugging. This is a skill. You have to learn how to debug. And it's something I really can't teach you very much. It's just something that you learn by experience. Just like if you're learning to play soccer, I really can't teach you to dodge left and right. Okay, I, I never was good at soccer. Maybe I could have teach you how to dodge left and right if I was skilled at it, right? But, you know, getting out on the field and running, you know, and dodging is going to teach you how to do it. Sitting down and programming and getting stuck is going to teach you how to figure out how to debug quite often you know the best learning occurs after you've banged your head against the keyboard 20 times trying to figure out what's going wrong now I don't want y'all to bang your, your head against the keyboard 20 times twice or three times is probably enough so go ahead and text me pictures if you get stuck but in here you'll see me run into programming problems because I write these off the top of my head rather than type them in you know from a piece of paper one of the reasons I write them off the top of my head is so that hopefully I get into a place where I have to do some debugging and y'all see how to do it. What does that involve? Well, maybe you add some extra print statements to see the value of your variables. Well, I was trying to calculate kilograms and it always comes out zero. I may need to add some print statements to let, you know, figure out the interim values, the temporary values that are being used in that or whether a certain if statement is being activated or not. So you'll see me add extra print statements when I'm debugging. There's also a kind of program option in your IDE called a debugger, which lets you step through your code line by line while it's running. So you can actually watch it run, right? Normally what happens is we run it and now all that magic happens in the background and we just see a little window. But it'd be nice if we could see the source code and have it indicate line by line where it is. Now, I'm not familiar with IELTS debugger, but I ought to become familiar with it so that I can teach y'all how to use it. We've already covered a lot of this stuff, so you saw me scroll past it quickly. This is a comment. We know what a comment is. 
this author put in fancy lines above it to make it above and below it to make it easy to read. Yeah, you use white space to make your program easy to read. What's white space is just when you hit return, you know, add some white space, just like you were going to separate paragraphs in your essay with a blank line. But you can also format your comments all fancy like. Now there's, a, uh, you know, kind of a point of diminishing return where if you put in too much, you know, stuff, it becomes kind of visually noisy. There's nothing wrong with that. This is their example of their comment block. You don't see me do that. I just put my name up at the top and the date and what it is. Okay, so there's a glossary. What is the interpreter? That's the so-called engine that executes Python commands. Your program runs against the interpreter. And I'm going to use the example of the emulated video games again because I know that a lot of y'all have played with like video game emulators. You've installed something on your computer that'll let you run old-fashioned programs like Nintendo or Sega games or PlayStation 1 games or whatever. The emulator. No. Say we had our old Nintendo. Original Nintendo. It had a 8-bit chip in it called a 6502. And it could display only like 300 by, you know, 200 pixels on screen. Something like that. Like really primitive graphics. So, you know, Mario was really blocky and stuff. But a lot of people like that style, right? You know, um, you know, people intentionally draw stuff to look like it was done, you know, on old-fashioned computers and video games. So, it had this old kind of video card in it, which could only display eight colors on the screen at a time, and it had a specific chip, and it ran on a very specific set of hardware. There's no way that that program would work on your Mac, on your Windows computer, whatever, right? You can't just take what they call it is a binary copy of the of the cartridge, a binary file, a bin file. So somebody uses a piece of hardware to copy that cartridge and to store it in a file format that can be installed on computers. But just because you have a file doesn't mean it's going to work, right? Just because I could download somehow an Android app on my phone, it's not going to work. On my iPhone, it's not going to work, or vice versa, right? Completely different platform. So what they do, what the clever people who do, and, and this is, you know, multiple people work in teams on this stuff to get it to work perfectly because they think it's fun. They write what's known as an emulator. An emulator pretends it has that chip in it. An emulator pretends in memory that it has this kind of video card and then it translates it to the kind of stuff that can actually be displayed on our phone or on our tablet. Or Some people have even written uh, the source code for Doom was published, uh, you know, one of the classic first-person shooters or whatever, and, or was it Wolfenstein? And so people have ported Wolfenstein to run on all sorts of different things so that you could sit there and on your printer screen, right, your little printer configuration screen, you could be playing the, the, the first-person shooter game or whatever. And to get that to work, they wrote some kind of emulation layer. So the emulator opens that binary file, pretends it is everything that's working inside the Nintendo in order to display it on the screen. And so it's working inside the modern computer. It's a layer that changes, that supports that binary file to get it to work with the computer. So if I was going to draw this differently, and I don't know why I'm doing it in red. It's hard to see in red. You have your computer, your modern computer, whatever it is, a phone, whatever. People write emulators so that you can play Joust and Defender on your Android phone or whatever. Yet you have the emulator, which is running on the computer, and it translates the commands that are in that binary file of the wrong format into stuff that will work on your computer. Python works the same way, except it's not an emulator, it's a Python shell the Python interpreter, which takes these Python commands, like the print command, and it interfaces with the computer to accomplish that printing. This is actually a great idea because you could rewrite that Python interpreter, right? Just because I could play my Nintendo games on my PC, that emulator is not going to work on the Mac because the Mac has a completely different operating system, and it's not going to work on Linux. 
Now, the cool thing is, is that you can install Windows emulator software on your Mac and on your Android machine, and vice versa. You can install the Macintosh emulator on it. But that's what it's doing, is it's translating from one format into the specific instructions that the computer has to run. And so these Python commands get run through the Python emulator, the Python interpreter, interpreter, the Python shell. This textbook called it the interpreter, called it, it, called it the, but you know, when you launched, you saw that it was called the shell. Same thing. It interprets the Python commands to run on the computer. And this is a good idea because you could write Python for your phone, for your iPad. I've got Python on my iPad. So that you can run it online. We've seen that you can run Python online, or at least I posted a link to it. Right. That makes it cross-platform so that the same code will run on any computer that a Python interpreter, Python emulator has been written for. That is good news because if you wrote a C++ program, it makes it executable, which runs lickety-split fast, but it's specialized for just one platform. It writes it, oh, the C++ compiler creates an executable that runs on Windows. Well, too bad if you're running something other than Windows. It's not going to work. Or, they see, or it compiles into something that will run in, on an Android phone. Well, too bad it's not going to run on your tablet or whatever. So C++ is great, but it makes platform-specific code. Python's not as fast as C++. It's easier to use. It's not as fast as C++, but it runs on a whole bunch of different computers. That's the idea of the interpreter. Take the Python commands, convert them into something that actually controls your computer. And that's the reason that people are able to write, you know, online Python interpreters. Python Online 3, I think the one I showed y'all was on a site called Replit. And then I could type my Python right here. Print. Hello. Right. If your computer ever dies and you want to do and you need to do some homework, borrow somebody else's computer and use an online Python 3 interpreter. Like that. When I'm ready to run it, save, run, and boom, it goes. It printed. But this is actually kind of neat. Some people actually think that's cooler than using idle, right? Because it's got the code and the uh, stuff right on the same screen and one really 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 nice thing is it's got line numbers down the side so if this tells you an error occurred on line 32 it's real easy to spot error 32 whereas in idle we just have to move the cursor up and down and there's a little number down at the bottom telling us our line number all right wake up i know i was waving my arms around and these in and got boring there for a second let's get back to the how to think like a computer scientist Chapter 2. Variables. What is a variable? It's a named piece of data. N is equal to 17. N is the name of the memory address where the 17 is stored at. Pi is the name of the memory address where 3.14159 is stored. These are called assignments. We are assigning the value 17 to that variable. We are assigning that number to the variable named pi. And I know I've mentioned this before, but I'm going to mention it again just because it's kind of a test question kind of thing. Why don't I type my notes in directly to a Python program so that when I upload it, they're already right there. All right. This is lecture D. I'm going to put my name. You don't have to put your name there. You could just put the name of the, well, if it's homework, I definitely want to see your name there, right? I am going to put the date there, you know, you could instead put, you know, what homework assignment it was if you were doing homework. Okay. And I'm going to start my quotes with double quote, tri triple, triple double quotes, but you could use triple apostrophes as well. A variable is a named location in memory that can hold data. When I say that can hold data, that's its entire reason for being. To hold data, because that's what your program is doing. It's manipulating data. If your program's not manipulating data, there's absolutely no reason for it to exist, right? Got to be doing something, even if it's just counting numbers on the screen or drawing a picture. 
So a variable has four parts. The first three are what are most important to us. It's got a name. This should look familiar. I've already typed this. It's got a type. It's got a value. And it's got a memory address where the data is stored. Now the interpreter, Python shell, picks a memory address for us. We have no idea where on the computer it's, it's where it's running. You know, we don't know which chip it's running or what memory, you know, what number byte it's on. In the C++ language, you can figure that out, but in most programming languages, you don't ever get to find out the memory address because there's nothing you could do with it. And so if we did pi is equal to 3.14159, we know the name of it. Name equals pi. We know the type of it. It's a floating point number. So I could just call it float. That's a nickname for floating point. How do I know it's floating point? It's got a decimal point in it. Decimal point. It's got a value. Value is 3.14159. It's memory address. Who cares? I'm going to leave that off. I'm, I'll never ask you for the memory address of a variable. I've brought shame to my ancestors. 3.14159. Thanks. And of course, it's really an infinitely long number. If I correctly recall, I believe that's called an irrational number. I like that term, irrational, right? Because we use irrational like, you're just not being rational. Right? Pi is just not being rational. That equal sign is called the assignment operator or the assignment token. There's a different symbol which means something similar, but it's got two equal signs. Looks like this. If I do this, x equals 3. This is an assignment. When I talk about it, I'll when I'm, write, when I'm writing the code and I'm narrating what I'm doing for y'all, I'll say x equals 3. And then if I want to write an if statement, I'm going to use the same word, equals. If x equals equals 3. Notice I said equal equal. I've learned to try to say equal equal to differentiate it from that. But this is an if statement. It compares. So you use a single equal if you're assigning. You use a double equals to compare, to check to see if it equals. So this single equal sets a value. The double equal compares a value. And if you mix those up, it just won't run. If I say x equals equals 3 in my code, well, it might not crash, but it's not going to do what I wanted it to do. And if I say if x single equal sign 3, that's a syntax error and it won't even run. So we got to get those right, but it becomes second nature pretty, pretty soon. But I always get the question, why is it a double equal? And that's why. Is the language just needed a way to distinguish one from the other, right? Because they're two very different things. One is putting a value somewhere and the other is checking to see what the value is. Now this is like, you know what, I don't even know how to write this in some kind of mathematical language. You know, th this is like, um, you know, algebra or whatever. If you ever took an algebra class or some kind of math class, you're familiar with the idea of, you know, x or you're solving for the value of gravity or the, you know, the heat of this substance in chemistry or whatever. We're real familiar with this.
But this is kind of a logic thing, and I don't really know how that ever gets expressed in math, or even if it does. I'm sure one of you math majors could tell me. Anyways, it's a programming idea. We're checking to see if something is equal to something else. Sometimes, I'm going to write this and then I'm going to erase it, so don't necessarily do it. Sometimes people would do that, right? That's not programming, although they could have chosen that. Oops. That would say copy the value of 3 into x, and you'll see that in textbooks. Draw an arrow if your program is putting 3 into x. You'll see that in textbooks. I don't recall. I guess we'll see pretty soon when we're talking about pseudocode. Or inside pseudocode, you may see it say something like this, set x to 3, right? But this is all just kind of pseudocode. Well, I guess I'm not going to erase it. This is all kind of pseudocode stuff. It's loosey-goosey. It's not actually part of our programming language. Or set x equal to 3. That's probably the way I'm going to go inside pseudocode. You just need to know that if you see the word set inside pseudocode, that word doesn't exist in that format in our programming language. You just leave it out. I'm sorry it's confusing, but it's just like when you're using French uh, versus English or words that you leave out or you know you change them around as, as you translate it in your head in order to try to speak the language. So I am going to add a comment that leave the word set out. when actually writing your program. Use it in pseudocode. We're supposed to stick it in our flowcharts as well, but half the time I forget to do that. And flowcharts if you remember to do so. I'm not going to count your flowcharts wrong if you don't have the word set in your, in your flowchart. So that's, that's information about variables, named location and memory. Why do we need to store something in data? So that we can modify it. So we can calculate the pay rate. So we can calculate, you know, the temperature based on the other temperature. So that we can, uh, you know, hold the output that we're going to send to the printer. Whatever. Hold the data that we want to store in the screen in the form of a graph. Hold the list of songs we want our MP3 player to play, right? All that stuff's got to be stored in memory. So when reading or writing code, say to yourself, n is assigned 17, or n gets a value of 17. Don't say n equals 17. Well, I'm sorry, but that's what I'm going to say. So variable names versus keywords. I think we've talked about this. A very, have we? A variable name cannot begin with a number. Have we said that yet? No. Nope. Pardon? Well, we're going to say it again. There are rules for variable names. <clears throat> variable name must start with a letter, uppercase or lowercase. So variable names must start with a letter. No spaces allowed. Numbers are fine. Underscores are fine. Everything else is forbidden. Now I bet if you had a Korean keyboard you could make your variables, you know, with Korean symbols and if you had, you know, a Spanish keyboard that supported, you know, the accents over the N and stuff like that, then you could, you know, I'm sure that you could create your variable names with those in them as well. Pretty sure that's the case. But I can't prove it. I don't have that kind of keyboard. So, 2019 tax rate, that's an illegal variable name. That's a syntax error. Tax rate. 2019, that's a good variable name. 
tax space rate is an illegal name, bad name, syntax error, tax underscore rate, that's a good name, upper versus lowercase matters, fancy term for that is case sensitive, A equals 3 is not the same thing. thing. as capital A is equal to 3. And that's true of the commands as well. Yeah. People are used to hitting the shift key. So they'll type print. That's syntax error. Just because the language wants a lower case. That doesn't mean you can't use capital letters for your variable names. I may do that occasionally. If you like capital letters in your variable names, go for it. Because like if you had the word first name as your variable name, there's like three different ways. Well, there's lots of ways you could do that, right? You could do first name. That's a very that's a valid variable name. You could do first capital N name. You could do first underscore name. You could throw in lots of caps. You could make it all caps if you wanted to, but that, that looks kind of weird. Most people don't use all caps. Uh, they use all caps to mean something very specific, a constant. So don't recommend using all caps. Still, you'll use me C capital letters every once in a while, specifically uppercase L because it looks a lot better than a lowercase l. Lowercase l, bless you, lowercase l looks like a 1. This has a funny turn, funny name. I mean, not funny, laugh out loud. But this is what's known as camel case. Why? Because it's got a hump in the middle. I swear I didn't make that up. Some people call this snake case because it's got an underscore in it. I'm not going to write down the term snake case. I'm sorry. That's a little bit too silly. But camel case is a very, very, very common name used in a whole bunch of different textbooks. This is considered a more modern naming style than this. This looks like 70s and 80s. Well, guess what? I learned a program in the 70s and 80s, so I like underscores, and I'll be giving them you examples of them. I like underscores when I'm teaching. Because I swear that if I start mixing uppercase and lowercase names in it, there's going to be typos. Some people won't put the uppercase letter in one place, and they'll do it in another place. Right? And then uh, it takes us an extra minute or two to debug that. I have to wander around. So I tend to avoid camel case, even though it's considered the more professional, the more modern way of doing it. So I'm just going to put the modern way in quotes. Just to let you know that if you want to be awesome and you feel like it, typically what people do is they only make the second word have the capital letter. You could, you know, capitalize the F as well. But the, the, the specific camel case syntax that most people follow is like if you have several words, you only capitalize the second and the third and the fourth. Right. So patient high in meters. Now I'm never going to use a variable name that this long, especially when giving examples, right? Because I don't want y'all to have to sit there and type, you know, for 10 minutes entering a single word and then uh, misspelling height because, you know, it's easy to leave the H off and sometimes, you know, you might miss hitting the shift key on the M and stuff like that, right? But that's a good variable name. It makes it very clear what it is. It's just a little bit too long for us. On the other hand, this is pretty lame, right? Patient height and meters. Because if you see program, the, the, if you see the letter P in some source code, you don't know what it means. Abbreviations are also kind of lame, but they're kind of tempting sometimes. Patient height meters. Well, that's still kind of hard to read, right? You see PHM. Although, you know, if the abbreviation is really common, right? There are abbreviations that's really uh, 
are really common. I'm sure that in your particular discipline of study, you have some uh, like BMI, body mass index. I'm just going to go ahead and use the letters BMI rather than write out the whole word body mass index. So this is a good variable name, but a bit too long. I really don't see very many uh, variable names like that ever that are that long. You might just use height, right? Height M for height in meters, right? Something like that. Yeah. Adequate for our purposes. H. Well, it's okay for demonstration, right? But it's not professional. Single letter variable names should be avoided except in certain circumstances, which are just for counters, right? You're going to count from 1 to 10. Why not just put X, right? X equals 1 to 10. But avoid single letter variable names in general. Just because you want to make your code as easy to read as possible, as easy as to understand as possible. Because if you're writing code professionally, eventually somebody else is going to be working on it right you quit your job or you publish your code on the internet and you want somebody else to be able to understand it or you have co-workers or you come back to your code two years later to try to you know write version 2.0 you know you so you avoid single letter variable names because they are not clear avoid single letter variable names except for counters why type the entire word counter if you can just use X or I or something like that so you'll see me use X. In fact, you're going to see me use a lot of single letter variable names, but that's just because we're learning examples for the most part and for ease of typing so that we can type more quickly with fewer errors. So I tell you to do no single letter variable names and then I do them. Sorry, but it helps the class go faster. 20, or 76 trombones is not a valid variable name using a dollar sign. Some languages let you use dollar signs in your variable names, but most don't. So caution, beginners sometimes confuse meaningful to humans with meaningful to the computer. What does that mean? Variable names are meaningless to the computer. They don't care if I say name or you know height equals six I hope I didn't do that. All right, all right, that's cool. The computer doesn't say here if I called my variable X or Tony Stark or, you know, Ben's Baton somewhere in, in, in Hungarian, right? That only is supposed to mean something to me. The computer doesn't care what the variable names are. Variable names are important to us because they understand. We understand what they mean, but the computer doesn't care that this number six is stored in something called height. Just like if you have some mailboxes, right, and uh, for your apartment complex, and then you have, you know, and the mailboxes are labeled, you know, one through sixty-four because there's there's sixty-four different, yeah. You know, if you go and you paint some graffiti on those mailboxes, you'll still probably get your mail, right? You know, even if you write your tag, your initials on the mailbox, the mailman's not going to care, right? He's still going to deliver your email to the right package. Quite often, mailboxes and apartment complexes don't even have names on it, right? Nobody cares. Except, you know, you and me. Might be nice. I might want to put my name on the mailbox just to make it easier for me to spot. If you work in an office, all the cubby holes, right, have names just to make them easy to spot. But they could just have easily have been numbered if somebody told you that you were employee number 32. So height is equal to, H is equal to 6. Tony Stark is equal. You don't have to type all these examples. Bez Pitange, right? <laughs> Whatever. Okay. Computers don't care what our variable names are. They need to be meaningful to us. Just to understand the code. So we get to pick them. 
We get to pick whatever variable names we like, whatever ones we understand. I will probably never count off for having a bad variable name. Maybe I'll knock you off if you have H instead of height. Probably not. If I do, I would let you reassign it, right? I mean, I would like I, I would let you redo the assignment to get full credit for it. That's kind of picky, and I'm certainly not at the beginning going to be that picky because we want to learn logic, right? <laughs> not spelling picking good names. So you'll see instructors who do not choose meaningful names when they teach beginners. Hey, this will be my excuse for why I use single letter variable names. I'm intentionally doing this because it's common practice for instructors not to choose meaningful names. Nah, it's just because I've already explained why. Not because we don't think it's a good habit, but because we're trying to reinforce that the message that you write the code to calculate the average. You have to write the assignment statement and the computer doesn't care what those names are. Just because I say average equals seven doesn't mean that the computer is going to magically calculate some kind of average later on. We would have to calculate the average. So what is a statement? A statement is like a sentence. X equals three. If X equals equals three. Print X. Right. It's a line of code. All right, fancy terms. Operators and operands. Operators are symbols. Operators are standing by. No, operators are symbols. Not words, they're symbols. Plus, minus, multiplication. Division. Star star. What does star star mean? I've mentioned it once or twice. Power up. Power up, right? Two star star three means two to the power of three. Which if you're not a fan, math fan, it means two times two times two. Two multiplied by itself three times. And then there's slash slash. Who remembers that one? Divide, round, down. Floor division is the technical word for it. I'm going to go ahead and add those in parentheses. Power of or exponent. That's what that one means. And slash slash means floor division. Round down. Now, a lot of other languages use slash slash to mean something completely different. They use it instead of the hash sign for a comment. So they don't have a way to do floor division, although they could have made another, you know, another keyword for it. If they, I mean, another symbol for it if they'd chosen to. There are other operators, right? There's the equal sign. And then there are the comparison equals, right? Those are operators, too, because they're symbols. Now, there's several different kinds of operators. The most common one we're going to see are called binary operators. Not because, ooh, zeros and ones. Everything is zeros and ones to the computer. But because they require two parts, right? Binary operator needs two pieces of information. What do I mean by that? A equals three, right? That's the operator. But the equal sign is not going to do anything unless there's pieces of information around it, right? <coughs> X times Y, right? The operator is the asterisk. The pieces of data, which we're going to give a fancier word for, shorter, are the X and the Y. So the operator is a symbol. The operands. are the data the symbol works on. So the operators are the symbols. The operands are the data the symbols use. So if we have the statement A is equal to 3, 
the operator is the equal sign the operand, if I could spell it, operand is equal to, is the operands are A and 3. I don't need to give a, a whole bunch of examples, right? Operators star, the operands are X and Y. You'll hear me use the term operand a lot, so you may as well just go ahead and get used to hearing it, even though it's not an English word that, you know, we use in any other context. Very rarely do you say you're going to Walmart and, oh, by the way, here's my operand. Yeah, don't don't do that. I guess if you hear the term, if you read lots of detective books, the operandus. Yeah, yeah, it means the method, the method of operation. If you're a, you know, Sherlock Holmes may have been looking for the operandus. There's also, so these are called binary operators because they need two. Well, there's like the game Uno. I don't know why it's called Uno, but Uno means one in Spanish, right? Then uh, Uno means one operand. There's really not a lot of those. Minus three, right? We think that's a number. It's not a number, it's an operand, a minus sign, followed by a number. And the meaning of that operand is flip this to make it negative, right? Just like it was zero minus three. So that's a unary operator because it took one operand. I think I'm just gonna erase that because I don't even wanna write down the term unary operator because it's like there's only one of them. There's only one that I can think of. And Ternary means three. In some languages, there are ternary operators. And you think, how in the world can a symbol need three pieces of data? Well, Python doesn't have them, so I'm not going to go into that. Binary operators. Pretty much everything we use needs two pieces of data. But not all things are as simple as that, right? What if we have this? A equals three plus four, five. There's lots of operands and operators here. They're still all binary operators, right? That is an operator, and then these are the operands that that one uses. And then once that gets evaluated, right, it's the same as that. So this stuff is evaluated first. Three and five are the operands for the plus sign. And then the result of that and that variable are the operands for the equal signs. Kind of like nesting dolls, right? You know, the Russian toys where you have a little thing and a bigger thing and a bigger thing or whatever. And they kind of nested inside each other. Well, how do you know what gets done first, right? Did the plus sign happen before the equal sign? No. This had to be evaluated. The expression, this is called an expression. An expression is something with an operator in it. It has to be evaluated before it can be used for the equal sign, right? I'm not going to copy 3 into A and then, oh, maybe later add the 5 to it. This has to be done first. Computers do things in a very specific sequence. They do the math, and then they copy the value. So the 3 plus 5 is done first, and then the equals, and then the assignment. This is still a pretty simple expression, right? That's junior high algebra. Now we're going to do high school algebra. I'm kidding. I don't know what level is taught at what anymore. New math and then the uh, common core, you know, whatever. A is equal to 3 times, no wait, plus 4 times 5. Now, if I was going to punch that in the calculator, I would type in 3 plus 4, and it would show me 7. And then I would hit times 5, and 7 times 5 is whatever 7 times 5 is. That's not the way it works when we write it out like that. That's calculator math. <clears throat> if you had a fancy calculator, Right? We're allowed to type in a whole bunch of stuff and then hit the enter key. 
you know, you have your TI-30 or your $500 TI-99 that you bought for chemistry and never used. So, you got this. What's going to be done first, the plus sign or the times? Multiplication happens before addition. Multiplication happens before addition. There are specific rules for that. We're going to get more fancy about what we say. These are called the order of operations. I kind of like calling them priority, right? That's not the exact word. But, you know, multiplication is higher priority. When I say that, you understand it immediately, right? The fancy word for that is also precedence. We can use those terms interchangeably. Why am I mentioning that multiple terms? Just because some textbooks call them precedence and some textbooks call them <laughs> order of operations. I don't remember which one our book does. We'll find out. Just memorize them both, huh? So the order of operations, what if you had this expression, right? What if I added those? I'm going to remove those because um, then that makes a statement a lie. Because what happens first? Parentheses happen first, right? So even before addition and subtraction, parentheses happen first, which I'm going to nickname P. And I'm sorry, I have somebody in the hospital. Forgive me for being rude and checking my text message. All right, so after parentheses, star star, exponent, which we're going to nickname E. Then multiplication and division, right? Multiply and divide. We're going to nickname that MD. Those have equal priority. Lower priority than exponent, but higher priority, higher precedence than addition and subtraction. So, what are we going to call that? AS. Now, why did I write these letters out here? Because somebody decided that we could memorize that as P-E-M-D-A-S. And how are you going to memorize that? You're going to come up with a cute little phrase. Cute little phrases are called mnemonics if we want to get fancy with the name. Please excuse my dear Aunt Sally. Just like every good boy deserves favor or does fine or whatever if you're learning music and you learn these mnemonics. That's one for the order of operations. Please excuse my dear Aunt Sally. I don't care if you memorize that. I do care that you memorize, re memorize that you memorize that parentheses happen before exponents, which happen before multiplication and division, which happen before addition and subtraction. We'll probably hit this idea again. I know we will hit this idea again. Yes, ma'am. Which which one? Sounds, it sounds like the same thing, it's right. Same thing? It sounds like the same thing. Okay. I'd have to see the exact term and Google it to make sure because I've always heard it this way. But yeah, yeah, yeah. So that does not mean that multiplication happens before division or that addition happens before subtraction. 
it means that they have equal priority. What does equal priority mean? Right? When you're boarding the airplane, they'll say everybody with children come first. Right? In that case, everybody with children has equal priority. So it's first come, first serve at that point. All the first class passengers come first. Everybody in first class has equal priority. It's first come, first serve. Same with these. Doesn't mean all multiplication happens before division, but it does mean that all multiplication or division happens before addition and subtraction. So if we write a long expression, and I'm sorry to go off on this because, you know, you're thinking I didn't want to learn this much math, but you, you already probably know this stuff. If we do this, A equals parentheses 2 plus 2 star star 3 in parentheses plus 4 times 5. Sorry to make the numbers so big, but we'll figure it out. According to PEMDAS, what's the highest priority? We got to do the parentheses. Okay, but that, that gives us a strong clue, but then inside the parentheses, there's still some stuff to do. Then we got to use the exponents first. So we would do those exponents first, and we would get 2 times 2 times 2 is 8. So exponents first, which gives us 8. And then we add that 2 plus to it, and so we get 10. I don't care if you write all these individual notes. Now what can we do first? We're outside of the parentheses. We've handled that. What's next? Got to do the multiplication. And so, <clears throat> 4 times 5 is 20. Now we can finally do the addition. 10 plus 20 equals 30. There's nothing wrong with using parentheses even when they're not strictly necessary. If you feel like doing this, 10 plus 20 parentheses plus 30. The parentheses, whoops, I meant to make that a multiply, sorry. That's not strictly necessary according to computerese or math logic, you know. But if it makes it easier to read, there's nothing wrong with using parentheses to make it easier for the humans to read, even if it doesn't change it as far as the computer is concerned. So I'll just rewrite that and say parentheses group parts of the expression together. You can use parentheses even when not strictly necessary. Even when not necessary. For, for clarity. Now, when do you need to use parentheses? Well, we already know from this when something has to be done first. But here we go. More high school math or junior high math or whatever. If we have this expression, x equals. 1 plus 2 over 3 plus 4. And I needed to turn that into a computer expression. x equals, I'm making a mistake, 1 plus 2 divided by 3 plus 4. What's wrong with that? Yeah, this is the first thing that happens, and that's not the first thing that happens in this, right? So what do we got to do to fix it? Good old parentheses, right? We would have to do that in order to solve that. That's called composition. I'm composing an expression that matches a formula. There's a difference between a formula and an expression. Usually, if I give you a formula and a homework assignment, 2 pi r, whatever, I would probably give it to you in the form of an expression. But if you look up a formula on the internet, it may not be written as an expression. I'll give you an example of that. If you see something like area 
is equal to 2 pi r, or something like that. You've seen this happen in math books. They leave out the multiply symbol. And so if you type in a equals 2 pi r, that's going to be a syntax error. Instead, you have to put the asterisks. Just because textbooks like to leave out the asterisks for some reason, to make them easier to read, we're not allowed to. There's another one. P. I'm almost forgetting my, my physics. N R T over V. If I ask you to, on an exam, on a quiz, to write that as an expression, you better not put P is equal to N R T over V. Okay, now I probably wouldn't count you off on that, right? Because you don't know what it is. This is a single thing or three different things. I better make it clearer than that. But what you really do is you have to use the multiply symbols. You have to put n times r times t or four. But obviously, if the expression is 2n, you know, x is equal to 2n, you're not going to just type in x is equal to 2n. And if you answer it like that on a, on a quiz or an exam, you're not going to get full credit for it. You have to say x is equal to 2 star n. Now, the fact that I've given you three or four examples of that means it's probably going to be an insane question. Just tuck it away in your head. You've got to put the asterisks there in order to get a formula to work. So I will type in my notes. You can't leave off multiply symbol just because the textbook or internet formula, the textbook formula does. Like if we look up the formula for uh, area of a rectangle, area of rectangle, lo and behold, there's no star there. But we know what that means. By the way, this isn't really a math class, so if I ask you to calculate the area of a rectangle, if I leave the formula off, it's fair. It's totally fine to text me and ask me for the formula. I'll give it to you, no problem. Often I'll even put that in the instructions. I'll either give you the formula or I'll say look it up and if you can't find it, text me. Right. Just it's not a math class. You don't have to memorize this. It's not, you know. Okay. So if the formula for area of a rectangle is A equals HW. Height times width. I know that the uh, thing just showed length times whatever. We have to type area is equal to h times width, or it won't work in a programming language. By the way, since the exams are open notes you wanted to, you could copy and paste all your notes into a single big word document and print that out, right? If you were taking it to the library or if you're going to take the exam in class, you know, you could store it all in one great big word document and then just use that. You know? So if you had to look up binary operators, you have your file here, you can do control F for find, type in binary operator, take you exactly to the right section of the notes. I'll make a folder where you can upload your notes so that they're easy to find even if you're not on the same computer. Okay, that was a little bit of a diversion, but not really. I just like to get ahead of the book so that when we see it in the book again, it makes sense and we can go through it faster. Now, unfortunately, that means like it means we take half the class to get through the first 
three chapters and then the other half of the chapters we fly through it right because we've already learned you know so we covered like you know another six chapters in the second half of the class that's a slight exaggeration but I don't mind doing it I'll restate that I prefer doing that I prefer inserting more information into the early chapters than the books require now the quizzes we'll just ask for what the books require until we actually hit it in the books but by the time we see it on the PowerPoint we've already learned it and we don't have to spend as much time explaining it then I don't know why I have that PowerPoint open that's not our programming language all right back to how to think like a computer scientist this is important type converter functions we've used the word float in our programs that's a type converter function. What does float do? It takes something inside quotes and converts it to a number. So you could do some math. I'll give you an example inside the shell here. If I do this, three times quote, the, the user typed in the value $1.98, right? 3.9181.981, whatever, right? That's not math. Yeah, I did not do math. It repeated this three times, but it didn't do math. We would have to convert that to a numeric form. This is a string. It's between quotes. By the way, notice it used single quotes rather than double. That's fine. We can use double. We can pick which one we like. And I like double because other programming languages use double quotes. So if I needed to do math and the data was of that format, it was a string, it was not a num numeric format, I would use the word float. I'm going to add a space here to make it easier to read. Three times float parentheses, quote, 1.98, end quote, in parentheses, gets us a real value. Kind of funky looking. I kind of doubt the veracity of that. That's an example of floating point error or floating point rounding errors. It's just because decimal numbers cannot be expressed precisely in floating point format. Of course they can be precise. Computers are precise, right? Okay, I'll give you a great example. One divided by three. Express that. Oh boy. Zero. Point three. No, that's not right. Tell me when to stop. Come on, somebody say stop. All right. Yeah. So if I stop there, that's really precise, but it's not the exact value. And yeah, in the math classes, there's a way of doing that. Right? You put a bar over the number, right? To indicate that it's an infinitely repeating number. But such a simple fraction cannot be expressed in what's known as base 10. Base 10 because it's got 10 digits, right? Just like, hey, what do you know? The word digit, just like fingers are also known as digits, right? Our counting system has 10 digits, 0 through 9. If we counted it out, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. I used up all 10 fingers to do that. Notice I started at 0. I keep saying this. Computers start counting at 0 rather than 1. It's just, just the way it is. This is actually the first value. So base 10, it is impossible to express 1 over 3 precisely if you don't have a bar over your number, which we don't have in, in programming. Everything inside the computer is expressed in binary, in base 2. Base 2 is a counting system where instead of 10 digits, we only have 2. We only have zeros and 1s. So things like point 0.1 cannot be expressed accurately in binary. I should say precisely. If we tried to express point 0.1 in binary, it would go on forever. And it can't go on forever. Right? We're not going to use up all 8 gigabytes of our computer storing point one 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 or whatever in binary. I don't know uh, what it is equal to. 
but I can demonstrate that you get floating point error real easily using point one. That's why I use point one here. So if I come up here and I type in point one times nine, okay, great, it's probably going to work. Point one plus point one plus point one. Let me guess, it's going to work perfectly. In some languages, I can get this to cause an error pretty quickly. There we go. Is that what it should have equaled? No. That's real close to being 0.8, but it is not equal to 0.8. So floating point math is not 100% precise. Integer math is, right? Integers are whole numbers. They can't get them wrong. How did I get off on that? Oh, because we need type conversion. Type conversion is converting from a string to a float. For example, the user types in that they make that their pay rate is $12 an hour and that they worked 40 hours that week. But they didn't type that. When they entered it, it came in the form of a string. Everything that comes in from the keyboard is in the form of a string. So their rate is 12.0. Their hours is, quote, whoopsie, their hours is equal to, quote, 40. And now when we try to calculate their pay, pay is equal to H times R. Kaboom. It says, cannot multiply sequence by non-int of type string. Okay, that's kind of gobbledygook, but it's not really. These are not integers meaning they're not numbers. They are strings. You can't multiply two strings together. We would have to convert those. Now, down here at the bottom of the... Uh, of the shell window, so to make it easier for people to see, I'm going to print that back up. So, why is it a string? I mean, what's the big deal? What if I do this? H is equal to input, parentheses, quote, hours, question mark, end quote, in parentheses, and I hit enter. It's so asking for the number of hours. I worked 40. Well, if I type H, or if I do print H, okay, great. If I type in H, it gives me some information about it. Now, this only happens in the shell. You can't just put the letter H into your program. But in the shell, it shows that it's got quotes around it, meaning that you can't do math on it. If I try to do print 2 times H, 4040. I'm not trying to spend too long talking about this, but it's real important. You understand the difference between a string and a number. A string is keyboard input. A number is math. It has to be converted. So here's what we have to do to get H into a format where we can do math. H equals float H. Now it is a number. So if I just type H, it shows that it's a number. There's no quotes around it. And if I print 2 times H, we get 80. We get what we want. All right, so I'm just going to put some lines here to indicate that we're in a new section. Type conversion. Keyboard input comes in as a string. A string is something between quotes. We don't type the quotes, but the computer adds them. Example, H equals input parentheses quote hours question mark. End quote in parentheses. If the user types 40, the computer gets, quote, 40, which is not a number. Looks like a number, but it's not, because the user could have typed in 40 space hours, right? They could have added the word hours to it, and that's certainly not a number. Can't do math on a string. It must be converted a numeric format. We have two functions for converting to numbers. We have the float function, which is the one we're going to use the most often. Why? Because it lets the user type in a decimal point. 
right. If I ask for my weight, maybe I know my weight down to a decimal, you know. Maybe I'm really, really concerned about my weight, and so I want to put, you know, 195.2. Maybe that 2 is really important to me. Okay, that's a silly example, but what about temperatures? You not only have a temperature of 98 or 99 or 100. You have a, you know, a temperature of 98.6, right? Celsius is even more imprecise because each number, you know, the difference between a 1 and 2 in Celsius is bigger than the difference between 1 and 2 in English. And the British use a measure of weight for some reason called stone. You ask a British person how much they weigh, their scales are in stone. So a stone is equal to 14 pounds. They may not even know that conversion. Just like I don't know how many feet are in a mile until I memorize it right. I say it's two, mi two miles to Walmart, and you ask me how many feet that is. Well, if I hadn't memorized it, I would not know, right? Not because I'm stupid. It's just because I don't memorize it, right? And so a lot of Brits don't even know that one stone is equal to 14 pounds. And so that's real imprecise, right? You would not want to write down either you weigh 12 stone or 13 stone. Your scale is going to show some fractional component. I weigh 13.9 stone, something like that. So to be precise, we like decimals. So we use float to do the conversion. But we could use int to convert to a whole number. But if the user types in a decimal, then it's going to crash. I'll give you a quick demonstration of that. We're going to need to take a break. There's a lot of people yawning, and I'm just about to as well. All righty. So, but if the user types in a decimal point, and we use int, the program crashes. So let's just use float almost all the time. Now textbooks might show using int a lot, but I've just demonstrated or I just stated the flaw with using int a lot. The drawback is that floating point is a little bit imprecise, but I'm willing to put up with that fact to stop our program from crashing. You know what? I better save this because I'm sure I've typed for a long time without it crashing. So if I do a is equal to int parentheses three quote 3.0 in parentheses. Just simulating the fact that we had an input statement and the user typed in 3.0, it looks like a whole number. To our brains, 3.0 is a whole number. To computers, it's not, so it crashes. But if I typed in A is equal to INT quote 3 without that decimal point, it works great. But I don't want my program to crash just because the user decided to type in the decimal point, so I'm going to use float most of the time. <coughs> Let's stop, gang, and come back in five minutes. Gang, back in the saddle. We may not make it all the way through this chapter, but that's okay. I'm getting an itch for us to actually do some programming. However, we already have talked about order of operations. So I can scroll past all that. Operations on strings. We've kind of talked about that too. You can do some operations on strings, but not many. Right? I can do three times the word Fred, and it makes it Fred, Fred, Fred. Are you going to use that very often? No, but what if I wanted to print a line? of underscores to make my coat my output look pretty. I could do three times quote underscore or a hyphen or something and okay that looks like a really wide smiley. You know. 40, 50 times quote underscore makes a nice long line. I might like that. So print parentheses 
quote 50 times quote underscore like that. That's about the only time I've ever used that multiplication thing against a string like that. You can use a plus sign for strings under certain circumstances. That's called concatenation. Got to always have fancy words. If you do this, Fred plus Barney. This is not math, but it's something. It did do something. Something actually useful. It, quote, added this string to this string. But, quote, added is not precise enough. Append would be more precise, but programmers decided to call it concatenation. It concatenates this to that. It left a space out, right? So Fred plus a space plus Barney. That starts to look a little bit better. That's called concatenation. So really, there's only two math operators that do anything with strings. That multiply, which is repeats it, and the plus sign, which does it. Concatenation. Why, when you, why would you ever use concatenation? I don't know. Let's actually do a little bit of coding, because we haven't done enough coding yet. So I'm going to end that, end all my quotes. Hopefully, I'd, I'm no longer in green text. I'm going to ask the user for their first name and their last name, and then I want to print a fancy message out. FN, for first name, there I go using a bad variable name, is equal to input parentheses, quote, what is your first name, question mark, and I've already told you all, I like putting little arrows to tell them where to type, so I'm going to add a space, space, greater than, not necessary, end quote, in parentheses. Now, I could have also used a print statement above that in order to ask, you know, I didn't have to put all that inside the input. Now, because I'm lazy, I'm going to copy and paste that and make it last name. Highlight it all. Right click copy. Paste it and except change it to LN for last name and then change that word to last. Oh you better So, I want to calculate their full name. Name equals FN plus LN. Now, I've already shown you what's going to happen. It's going to not have a space in it. So, if I print parentheses, quote, hello, end quote, comma, name. Now, run it. You type in Bugs Bunny or something. What is your first name? Bugs. What is your last name? Bunny. It says, hello, Bugs Bunny. Well, I don't want it to say Bugs Bunny. So I'm going to add a space in the middle of it. So I'm going to go up here, modify my expression. It's still an expression even though it's not math, right? Because it's got symbols. So fn plus quote space end quote plus ln. Now it's going to look a lot better.
What is your first name? Uh, Daffy. What is your last name? Duck. Ducky. Okay, I didn't mean to put Ducky, but in there. it looks better. That's concatenation. I'm going to put a comment to that effect. Using plus to combine strings to append is called concatenation. And just because doing that conversion stuff is so important, we're going to give an example of getting some input and doing the conversion, which we've already done, but I don't mind giving multiple examples. So I'm going to ask for their age. But I'm going to do it in the other style, where I do the print statement and then the input. All right. So after my little comment here, print parentheses, quote, how old are you? Or what is your age? What is your age? Question mark. Or how about what year were you born? What year were you born? Question mark. End quote. In parentheses. And now I'm going to get an input statement. But just typing input's not enough. I need to store the result in a variable. Year is equal to input. I could just do that. I'll show you why I'm not going to just do that. I like seeing the little symbol telling me. So I'm going to put something inside the input statement. You've seen me do this. Like space, space, arrow, in space, something like that. Or at least a greater than sign. I guess since it's on the next line, I don't need spaces. What's your first name? Joe. Bob. Hello, Joe. Bob. What year were you born? Question mark. And now it tells me where to type it in. It's totally up to you whether you use input statement with the prompt inside the parentheses, prompt meaning that message, or whether you use a print and an input statement. Why would you pick one over the other? What's different about this one? than this one, besides the fact that it's a different sentence. It's behaving a little bit differently. I'm going to hum the Jeopardy theme. This one's behaving a little bit differently than this one. It's presented on the screen differently. <laughs> Cursor's on the next line. Cursor's on the next line. This happens if you use a print and then an input. This happens if you just use the input and you put the prompt inside the input. Which do you like better? Write your programs for which you write better. I mean, which you like better. All right. Now I want to tell them about how old they are, right? I can calculate about how old they are by subtracting our current year from their birth year. Now that's not precise, right? Because it kind of matters on their birth date. But we can get close. Age equals 2019 minus year. There's an error in there, but I'm going to ride with it and let y'all tell me what the error is. You probably already know. Print. You are about, end quote, comma, age comma, begin quote, years old, period, end quote, in parentheses. Now that's going to crash. First name, Bob, what year you were born, 2000, boom, unsupported type. We've seen that error message. What did I need to do to fix it? And I already heard you say it. What's wrong with it? The error is in this line. Why couldn't it subtract that variable from that number? It's a string. We have to convert it from a string to a number. 
Now, since year, they're probably going to type in a whole number. Nobody says I was born in 1967.3. I could use INT pretty safely, integer, to make it a whole number. Why? Because otherwise the math is going to show that decimal point when I print it out. It's going to say that I'm 39.0 years old. Why not just say 39? So I'm going to convert it to an int. It's just up to you which data type you want. Year is equal to INT parentheses year. Convert it to an int. The only time you have to use float is if it's mandatory for the user to type in a decimal point or if you suspect they will. You don't have to. Usually I will, but in this case I want the output to be nice and pretty. So that's why I did that. Now it's going to work, I hope. What's your first name? Bob Thomas. What year were you born? 1980. You're about 39 years old. Well, that's, if I was born then, I'm either 39 or 38. So, yeah. Program's working. Why did we type this? I wanted to reinforce how you get numeric input. And I wanted to tell you, burn it in your brain, what concatenation is. You can use concatenation rather than commas in your print statement. Change that comma to a plus statement and run, and then you're not going to like the results. What's your first name? Donald Duck. Hello. Hello, Donald Duck. Right, let the space out. So, the comma, when used with the print statement, adds a space, which is usually what you want. But if you really didn't want a space, you can use a plus sign instead. But I do like a space, so I put the comma there. Now, somebody asked a very good question last, last semester, and it's the first time anybody had asked me, why can't I put a comma here? Right? Don't do this because this is a syntax error, right? Why can't I make it like this? I thought you said a comma gets turned into a space. Only in the print statement does the comma get turned into a space. So that would be a syntax error. So I better change that back to the way it was. You know what? I say this every class. I really wish I'd remember to bring my jacket. All right, while we're on the topic of printing, what if you have to print multiple lines of information? Rarely are we just going to print, I mean, you know, yeah, for our programs, we'll probably just be printing one line in a row most of the time. But what if you need to print multiple lines of information? Two ways to do that. Three ways to do that. What if I want to print... I love rock and roll. Put another dime in the jukebox, baby. You don't have to type that comment, but I'm going to show you how to do it. Three different ways. Maybe I could pick something that was a little bit shorter. Some kind of nursery rhyme with fewer words. Anyways. Tell you what, I'm going to erase that and just show you three different ways. Sorry I made you type that if you did. Print, parentheses, quote, when in the backslash in, backslash being the one above the enter key, not below the question mark, when in the course of human backslash in, events dot 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 end quote in parentheses that's way to print out that's one way to print out multiple lines using slash n which is the so-called new line sequence to kind of press the enter key right press the return key 
How come computers used to say return on the keyboard and now they just say enter? So here we go. That's one way to do it. How about this? Print parentheses quote when in the end quote in parentheses. Now this is going to be a lot more typing because I'm going to keep using the word print. Print parentheses quote course of human and quote in parentheses print parentheses quote events dot 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 end quote in parentheses that looks good I say it looks good I better test it but people are still typing so I don't want to cover the screen yet Maybe I can run it and then push the window over to the side. Probably not. All right. Maybe this will work. What is your first name? Joe. Bob. Born in the year 2000. All right. And here's what it printed. Two times it printed out when in the course of human events. One more way of doing it. One more way of doing it. Print, parentheses, triple quote. We've been using triple quotes for comments. But what it really does is declare a multi-line string. I almost never do this. I usually just use triple quotes for comments. But quote, quote, quote. When in the, hit the enter key, course of human, hit the enter key, events, dot, dot, dot. And since we had a triple quote to start the whole thing, we have to have a triple quote to end the whole thing. Quote, quote, quote. And you can use single apostrophes if you like the way that looks better. I don't care. Computer doesn't care. Textbooks seem to show single apostrophes more often. I like the double apostrophes. That'll work just as well. It's going to print the same thing as the others. Maybe single apostrophes are easier to see on the screen than double apostrophes. Maybe I'll start using them. Kind of like the way that looks. You just can't mix them up, right? You can't start with doubles and end in singles or vice versa. About time to pause and make sure y'all are doing okay. See if anybody has syntax errors. So operations on strings. You can't do a minus sign. You can't do plus if you're trying to put a number on it. What if we really, really, really needed to put a number on the end of a string? There is a way to do that. We have to use another type conversion command, but instead of int or float, we have to use string. So like this, message equals, and if I do year plus quote space was a pretty cool year, exclamation mark. That's going to be a syntax error, and I'm not going to run it to prove that it's going to be a syntax error because we have to type in like three or four things at this point. But here's how you would fix it. str parentheses here. Otherwise it wouldn't work. Year is a number so it must be converted to a string before it can be used in concatenation. Now normally you don't have to do that when you use the print statement because the print statement's smart enough to know that if you put a comma there that it has to convert a, a number into a string if it needs to. It figures it out.
but not when we're using concatenation. When we're using concatenation, we have to tell it very specifically to use the SDR function. That's not true in every language. All languages are different. If you're using a Java programming language and you put a plus sign, you can add anything together in order to concatenate it, and it does the conversion on the fly. It figures it out for us. It's kind of nice, but... So we've seen three different type conversion functions so far. We've seen I and T parentheses in parentheses float parentheses in parentheses and string parentheses in parentheses. Now notice I put a space here but there's no spaces here. Spaces are ignored except for tabs at the beginning. Sometimes I add spaces like that to make things clear. Right here you see me using spaces but the command would have worked just as well if I deleted all the spaces in this line like that, that, you don't have to go back and change them just a, a point of demonstration, right? That works just as well. If you feel like putting spaces inside your functions in order to make the functions easier to read, I sometimes do that, make it easier for y'all to see in the back row. But white space is usually ignored unless it's at the beginning of the line. So I just use parenthesis uh, spaces to make it easier to read, not necessary. Are there times when spaces are absolutely necessary and it will break if you don't? Very, very occasionally. I'll give you an example. There's a for statement that looks like this. I'm going to type it and then I'm going to erase it. For x in range 3. Okay, that's the statement. But if I took the spaces out, obviously that's not going to work, right? Or if x equals equals three if I took all the spaces out it doesn't know what that is but we're smart enough to figure out that you're supposed to put a space after the word if or it's not going to work so input we know how to do this n is equal to input please enter your name now this pops up a cute window, but that's because they're using PyScriptor. We're not using PyScriptor, so we don't get a cute window. It does display a message on the screen. We've done this a lot now. It's the fourth day in a row, probably, that we've done the input statements. Composition. I mentioned composition. I mentioned it before we hit it, so it's going to be easy to lecture on. If you see area is equal to 2, excuse me, pi r squared, I cannot just put pi r2. I have to put pi asterisk r star star 2, right, in order to get that to actually work. So that's a formula and that's an expression. And the act of converting a formula into an expression is called composition. Now when I'm talking colloquially, about the program, I'll say that that's the formula. Right? That's the formula for calculating area. Because strictly speaking, it is a formula too, right? It's just not a formula expressed in this nice textbook format where they leave out multiplication symbols and stuff like that. Oh, by the way, not that this is important, but how do you type exponents in on your typewriter in math classes? You probably use that symbol. I don't know why Python didn't use that symbol. <laughs> Bless you. Okay, now this is kind of crazy, but it's a valid point. You can mix your float and your input statements. Right here we did an input statement, and then we did a float. We did that in our code, right? Here they've combined them. Float input. That's totally valid. What does it do? Well, just like math, stuff inside the innermost parentheses gets done first. So input, what is your radius, happens first. And whatever the user types gets passed in as a so-called argument to the float function. And then that is calculated, and it's stored in R. 
If we really wanted to be tricky, you can do it all in one statement. Now, I don't do this. Print, the area is 3 star flow, parentheses, input, parentheses, what is your radius, in parentheses, in parentheses, star, star 2, in parentheses. Now, that's too complicated to type. I'll probably get it wrong. I'll probably leave out a parentheses or something. But it works. The input happens first because it's in the innermost parentheses. Whatever the user types in there gets passed to the float function. And then some math is done, and that's used as input for the print function. Works. So I don't do that. Yes, ma'am. It, because it's really smart. Now, that's a, a smart-ass answer. Here's the answer is that it does something known as parsing. And when it parses it, it figures out, it builds a little internal map of all the parentheses used, and it chooses to do the innermost ones first. Oh. Yeah. Just like when we were doing our math, we eyeballed it, and we said, okay, the stuff inside the parentheses has to be done first. The computer actually kind of builds an internal map of it so that it can do it. Real good question. I never do that, but this is real common. Right? Write it in one line rather than two. What do you save by doing that? Well, you just don't have to type R is equal to float R, so you get to save a few keystrokes. What's the drawback of doing it this way? You have to remember to use two closed parentheses. Else you get a syntax error, and the syntax error is subtle because it doesn't highlight that line. It'll show it on a later line if I left out those two parentheses. Let me give you a demonstration. I'm just going to copy that, paste it, and miss one of those parentheses. You don't have to type this. Right, but if I leave that out and I compile it, it's probably a syntax error. It should be. Boom. And I've mentioned this before. You can stare at it forever trying to figure out what's wrong with that word print. Did I misspell it? No. Did I have a capital P in it? No. Is there something wrong with this line? No. So you can start banging your head on the keyboard until you notice that there was a missing parentheses on the line above it. So whenever you're looking at a syntax error and it's showing the error, like at the beginning of the line, and you absolutely cannot figure out why, just go up a line and see if there's something wrong with that line. It would be real nice if it told us that it was because of a missing parenthesis. It didn't. So I guarantee that that will bite y'all, and it will probably bite me at some point. But that's why I avoid using those multiple, multiple, multiple parentheses and embedding a whole bunch of functions inside of a whole bunch of other functions. I hope y'all aren't typing that, because I'm just going to delete it. You can leave it if you want, uh, uh, if you were typing it. Don't, don't type it if you don't want to. I'm going to go back to here. Oh, the good old modulus operator. We've, we've covered that, have we not? Is that a yes? That's a no? All right. No problem. We will. Oh, good. It's the last thing in this chapter. <coughs> We're going to cover modulus. It's like something important that I don't think is ever covered in any uh, like high school or junior high math classes. Let me pop open the shell again. And I'm going to type in 12 divided by 5. And it's going to print 2.4. If I do 12 floor division 5, what's it going to print? 2. If I do 12 modulus 5, meaning the percent sign, it prints out 2. Okay, that was a bad example. Let me come up with a better one. 11 floor division 5 is going to be a 2. 11 modulus 5 is 1. What in the world is it doing there? Well, when you did floor division, 5 goes into 11 two times with a remainder of pointing at it. Right. And so 14 or 15 modulus 5, 5 goes into 15 three times with a remainder of nothing, right? And so it's going to print out 0. 16 modulus 5. 5 goes into 16 three times with a remainder of 1. Yeah, yeah. 19 modulus 5. 5 goes into 19 three times with a remainder of 
I had to think that one through for a second, but 5 times 3 is 15, 19 minus 15 is 4. That's what modulus means. It just means remainder. Why would you care? We're going to add something to our program, but let's just add it to the top so that we don't have to keep answering all these questions before we get to it. So right up here above, what is your first name? I'm going to say that I have pennies equals, I have collected pennies for a long time, and I have 369 pennies, and I want to know how many quarters that could give me. All righty. Quarters equals 569. Floor division, each quarter is worth 25 pennies. But there's going to be some pennies left over. Pennies equals 569 modulus 25. That's the remainder. Well, it's not 569. What am I doing? Copy that word pennies and paste it for there and paste it for there. My mistake. Right, why am I taking the trouble of storing that in a variable if I'm not going to use it? So that was my mistake. The word pennies should appear three times in our code here, and 569 should appear only once. And then I could print that out. Print. You have... Or how about number of quarters equals end quote comma quarters in parentheses print parentheses quote number of pennies equals end quote comma pennies so if you ever need the remainder when might you need the remainder well the task is going to take 79 minutes, and you want to find out how many hours and minutes that is. You don't really want to hear that 79 minutes is equal to 1.25 hours or something, whatever, right? I don't know exactly what it is. We don't usually like talking about 1.39 hours. We like hearing that it's one hour and 19 minutes. So you could use modulus to figure that out. Minutes equals 179. I'm going to put a, a comment here. Hint. 25 pennies and a quarter. And hint. 60 minutes and an hour. Now those are obvious, but like I said, not that many people have memorized how many uh, feet or yards are in a mile. So those kind of hints can sometimes be useful. Plus somebody reading, uh, reading this, uh, you know, in uh, some state that uses, in some country that uses metric is not going to exactly know how many yards are in a foot and stuff like that. And so hints are useful. <coughs> 60 minutes an hour. Bless you. I mean, thank you. Hours is equal to minutes. Floor division, 60. Bless you. Minutes is equal to minutes modulus 60. You see what we're doing there? First we do the division, then we get the remainder. Now this is a slight thing I don't like about doing what I just did which is I just erased the value of pennies. I no longer have the original number of pennies because I erased it right there, right? So I could have called that cents if I wanted to. I could have said cents equals pennies modulus 25 and then I could say number of quarters is equal to that, number of pennies is equal to that. I'm not done. I'm not going to go back and change that. All right. You could use that any time you're converting from one whole number to another. I wouldn't use it for conversion ratios that involve decimal points, 
like there are 2.54 centimeters in an inch, and so if I'm going to convert centimeters to inches, I wouldn't use modulus, most likely. But if the clean conversions, right, 3 feet per yard, 5,280 feet per mile, 16 ounces in a pound, I don't know how many uh, ounces are in a gallon, but, you know, that kind of thing. We have hit the end of the chapter. We will look at the glossary. The frequency of yawns is increasing, so we're going to get up and do some jumping jacks. I'm kidding. We might get out a little bit early, though. Let's uh, hit the glossary if this is working. Oh, we didn't add any print statements. Add some print statements yourself while I wander around and see if y'all do it correctly or not. Print out the number of hours and minutes. So, we know the uh, straightforward way. Of printing that out. Now I'm going to show you all a fancier way of printing it out. Now I don't care if y'all memorize this. This is just to show. Print, parentheses, quote, that or time is or time equals percent D hours and percent D minutes end quote, and this index is going to get a little, a little bit more complicated, but we're going to wind up using this more and more towards the end of the class as class goes on, I mean, you know, the semester. Open parentheses, close, close, and we're going to type in something between here. You see these placeholders? We're going to fill those in with variables. Right, we have two variables here, so I'm going to put the two variables inside those inner parentheses. Hours, comma, minutes. And it says the time is 2 hours and 59 minutes. My second parentheses wandered off the screen, so I'm going to remove some spaces. All right, there we go. Or I guess I could have changed the word is to equal, and it would have worked just as well. Okay. Now, why did I do that? Just so that I could put all that information in one line, in one print statement, and not have to do some STR parentheses business in order to print out the hours and the minutes, or have to just open in quotes and close quotes and commas and stuff like that. This is called a formatted print statement. And if you're going to be printing out two variables, or three variables or four variables, it's probably easier to use placeholders to get formatted print statements. All right. So we're going to have some homework based on this idea. We've learned a couple of things. So, we are all are familiar with like the esteemed works of Slim Shady or, you know, your favorite poem by Emily Dickinson or something like that. Take your favorite song, lyric, or poem, or whatever. Just make sure it's got multiple lines. That is three or more lines long. Now, don't type in a sonnet, right? You don't need something that's going to, you know, be 18 lines or whatever. 
I'll just say song lyric or, or quote, etc. That is three or more lines long. However, you want to break it up and print it out the three different ways we showed. We showed. Now we show three different ways. A, multiple print statements. B, and this is actually the first one we used, slash in inside a single print statement. And C, using triple quotes. Like I said, you don't have to go nuts and write a book or a sonnet or whatever. And it doesn't have to be your favorite, right? <laughs> just whatever, just pick something. All right, that's the first part of the homework. So that's part one. Part two is going to be using the conversion idea. We're going to convert the number of ounces to pounds and ounces. Using modulus for your conversion. Turn 1999 one nine ounces into pounds and ounces. And display the results. Now, the prior classes, I made them do like three or four conversions, but I think one's enough to prove your point, right, game? Any more? I want to make this take you four or five hours to get done. I'm kidding. That's probably about enough. And... I don't usually put this, but upload your PY file and a screenshot, or just a screenshot if you're doing it with an online <coughs> Python editor. Now, at a certain point, when your programs get more complicated, I'm going to ask you to really ought to give me the py file even if you copy and paste that into a text document a word document or whatever even if you're doing it online you know how to use word you could copy out of it and paste it into word all right So since we're ending a few minutes early, we can hang out. If y'all have questions over homework you've already been working on, some people just stay after class and write the homework right away while it's fresh in their mind, which you can do when the assignments are shorter like this. Any questions?